In retaliation, the Russian government passed a bill that prohibits Americans from adopting Russian children. And President Putin, before signing it at a news conference, uh, was quite angry about the bill that our government passed. And he said, who is the United States to condemn us about human rights when they've got Guantanamo? So it remains a blight on our reputation and one that uh, we waste an awful lot of money and an awful lot of credibility uh, to keep open. And it seems like at this point, 11 years into it, that it's become more of a, you know, by God we said we can do it and we're going to do it, whether it makes sense or not. And so we've got people over on the other side of, of the city that have made the decision that Guantanamo is going to remain open. And if you've probably seen, Congress has a 9% approval rating. Uh, there was a poll came out last week where in addition to saying 9% of the American public approves of Congress who has created these barriers to closing Guantanamo, it also asked people to look at, you know, which do you have a more favorable opinion of, Congress or, and then it gave them a number of choices. And Congress ranked uh, behind a root canal and head lice, <laughs> but ahead of gonorrhea and the Kardashians. So... Uh, <laughs> Part of Guantanamo, if you recall when President Bush signed the order in November of 2001 that authorized the detention of military uh, of, of detainees and military commissions, was creating this military commission piece that has now been going on for uh, about 11 years. And we've completed a grand total of six and a half trials in 11 years. I say a half because the last one was Majid Khan, who has pled guilty, but he hadn't been sentenced. His sentence was deferred because he's supposed to cooperate with the government, and in a couple of years after he's cooperated, then he'll go back into court and get his sentence. So I count him as a half. So we've really had six and a half trials in 11 years in this court system that has failed time and time and time again. And of those six and a half, we've recently had Salim Hamdan, the D.C. Circuit, which has just been, in my opinion, terrible on habeas, and effectively you know, drove a stake through the heart of the Boumediene decision from the Supreme Court. That same court, which I, you know, I guess that's why I don't bet, because I wouldn't have bet 50 cents on Hamdan winning, but Hamdan won at the D.C. Circuit in a unanimous decision that says that material support for terrorism is not a legitimate international law of war offense. So of the six and a half that were convicted, one has had his conviction overturned. So I guess we sit here now with five and a half convictions to our credit after 11 years of effort. Um, you know, if you followed the uh, Hamdan decision, there's another case, Al Balul. Al Balul was convicted of providing material support and conspiracy. The Department of Defense, uh, Brigadier General uh, Mark Martins, who I was the third chief prosecutor, General Martins is the fifth chief prosecutor. Uh, but he is, uh, the Department of Defense has concluded that material support and conspiracy are not legitimate international law of war offenses, and they have <coughs> declined to participate in the appeal, and they've dropped the conspiracy charge against Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and the other 9-11 detainees. But the Department of Justice has insisted on moving forward uh, on the appeal of al Balul, arguing that it is, those are legitimate offenses. So there's, the government has uh, two different opinions. But General Martins did a podcast yesterday on lawfare, if you, if you follow that. Um, and he was talking about why military commissions are necessary. He said, number one, there's no other option on where to prosecute these guys. Which is true because Congress said you can't bring them to the U.S. So you can't prosecute them in federal court. So we've created the obstacle that makes military commissions. we created our own justification. He said it's the best form in a small number of cases. But if you look, peel that back and look why, it's because of the no rights advisements and the abusive treatment and detention. You know, if you peel it back, it's not about what they did to us, it's about what we did to them that makes military commissions seem like an attractive option. And he said, you know, you can't have trained police out you know, in, in the middle of an armed conflict picking people up and doing rights advisements, which is true. And that's a great argument, and I think the public kind of nods knowingly that, yeah, it makes sense. You can't have soldiers out doing rights advisements. And I would concede that point, that they should prosecute in the military commission every person that was apprehended by a soldier on the battlefield during the armed conflict. Because I can't think of any. 
Because you had Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Majid Khan, Ramzi bin al Sheba, Abu Zubaydah, who were all arrested by Pakistani authorities in Pakistan. You had Hambali and Zubair, who were arrested in Thailand by the police. You had Nashiri, who was arrested in Dubai, and Durad, who was arrested in Somalia. So this notion that we have to have this special forum because of the battlefield conditions is a great smokescreen for this second-rate process that really says more about us than it does about the people we're trying to bring before it. I think another important piece is the issue of, of torture. You know, the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence recently completed their report, and you probably saw John McCain and, and uh, Dianne Feinstein said, you know, the report concludes torture didn't work, and it's a stain on our reputation. I think it's important that that report be de declassified and released to the public, particularly after uh, the premiere of Zero Dark Thirty, which purports to be uh, a factual representation of the uh, finding and killing Osama bin Laden. My fear is that movie is going to do for torture what Jaws did for sharks. It's going to become the public's perception of reality, and it's a lie. So I think that movie makes it doubly important for the Senate Select Committee's report to be declassified so the public can at least have a debate that's based on the truth and not uh, this Hollywood lie. And it's ironic that, you know, to this day, you know, John Kiriakou on the 25th of January is set to be sentenced and go to prison for revealing the name of someone that was alleged to have been involved in torture. So you, talking about torture will get you sent to prison. Committing torture makes you a hero. You've got Jose Rodriguez and all these people that have written books and they're heroes in the eyes of uh, you know, folks that believe that torture work. And they're walking free and we're sending somebody to prison for their words and nobody's gone to prison for their actions. And I mentioned, I think the drone program is another area where it's a mistake to talk about a program when we've got a military program that's governed by the laws of war. You know, where you hear people talk about, you know, these drone strikes, we use the principles of proportionality and military necessity and distinction and all the law of war rules that regulate the armed forces. And by following those rules, military personnel have combatant immunity. Where, if, you know, if you kill during combat is not murder, you have immunity as a combatant. And then collateral damage is a corollary of that. You know, if you drop a bomb and it kills the bad guy and some people around them, as long as you uh, applied the principles uh, of the laws of war, then those deaths are collateral damage that are covered by combatant immunity. But the CIA has a drone program, and that's a civilian agency with civilian contractors. They're not part of the military, and the law of war doesn't apply. They don't have combatant immunity, and collateral damage uh, doesn't apply absent combatant immunity. So I'm not sure where we get the authority to send civilians around the world to commit what I believe is murder. And then finally, we have the kill list, you know, where the president, uh, you know, when President Obama campaigned in 08. He talked about how the Bush policies were based on fear and we turned our back on our values and we were going to restore our reputation. But I don't recall President Bush having a kill list that gave him the unilateral authority to decide that an American needs to die without trial. So I think all those pieces of the puzzle, I'm hopeful, will get re-examined in a second term. If you recall when Ambassador Stevens' body came back from Benghazi and President Obama met the plane out at Andrews Air Force Base. He talked about the sacrifice they made and he said we were not going to be deterred, that America is always going to shine as a light unto the world. And I think what we've done for the last years, the last 10 years is we've been a warning light, not a guiding light. So I'm hoping in the second term we can turn that around and, and live up to the values that we purport uh, to represent.